So YouTuber Zenistrad1 recently made a video called Bio Truthiness, in which he voices his skepticism about socialized gender roles having biological components. This video is a response to that one. I'm going to talk for a moment here about gender and how it relates to biology. One of the things you commonly hear in internet debates about socialized gender roles is that gender has a biological component. I've always been very skeptical of this, and the reason for this should be obvious if you know your history, because different groups have very often tried to find biological justifications for the social norm in order to justify unjust social systems. The reasoning here is suspiciously similar to that of religious conservatives when they attack organizations like Planned Parenthood on grounds of the historical associations between family planning, eugenics, and racism. Now, it's true that the historical precedents of many such institutions had eugenic and or racist intent, but trying to slander them as they are currently constituted because of the vices of their predecessors is merely a cynical application of the genetic fallacy. And yet, portraying science as if it's a single unified institution with dubious antecedents can nevertheless make for effective rhetoric, especially amongst, well, stupid people. Which is why a telltale sign of anti-science propaganda is the historical scare story. In this case, them oldie timey racist phrenologists. Phrenology was a pseudoscience that looked at people's skulls to say things like, black people are just naturally more submissive than white people. It's a really weird example of scientific racism enforcing an unjust social hierarchy. Hmm, cool story, bro. Are claims of biologically ingrained gender roles necessarily pseudoscientific? I would say no. The real takeaway from phrenology is not that biological justifications for different social roles are necessarily pseudoscientific, but rather that these claims can be skewed towards whatever the cultural norm happens to be at the time. Susan Estrade quite sensibly denies that the very idea of biological factors in gender is necessarily bad science appealing to the authority of good science, aka pseudoscience. This, of course, entails two further things, that biological factors in gender might be pseudoscience and that biological factors in gender might not be pseudoscience. However, for whatever reason, he only focuses on the first condition, on the possibility of biological factors or claims thereof being pseudoscience, as would any claim skewed towards cultural norms. He is not, however, particularly forthcoming on the second condition, and thus upon what evidence he'd accept as good science, and to which he would thereby, I assume, defer as someone who is not, I hope, anti-science. We thus leave this apparently even-handed assertion with a much clearer idea of what constitutes failure than we do success. And for most of the remainder of his video, Zenestrade sets about evidencing such failure by citing Cordelia Fine's 2010 book, Delusions of Gender. What this book sets out to do is debunk the claim that men and women are hardwired to have different interests and preferences. Not to say there are no biological sex differences, but rather that they're not hardwired or set in stone. One of the things that she cites is that the brain is well known for its plasticity, so even if these differences do exist, that does not mean that they can't be changed due to outside factors. If Fine had set out to use plasticity to sever any possible link between base biological sex difference and its manifestation in higher level interests and preferences, she would have failed, because plasticity simply isn't up to that job. It's not a serviceable replacement for the utopian ambitions of the blank slate. It does not, given what's known of it, guarantee existential post-revolutionary self-actualization, either for the transgendered, nor for anyone else. For one thing, the human brain is not uniformly plastic. Bin Shadler et al. 2010, for example, demonstrate that the hippocampus is nowhere near as plastic as the cerebral cortex. And there are numerous other examples, such as colour processing structures, which are only amenable to inputs from specialised visual neurons. Neither is neuroplasticity itself a uniform phenomena. There are at least four types of neuroplasticity presently discussed in the literature. Homologous area adaption, 
cross-model reassignment, map expansion, and the marvelously titled Compensatory Masquerade, each of which preserves different functionalities, offers different degrees of adaptability, and predominates in different brain structures. The upshot being that if, as they may well, biogenetic factors in interests and preferences are realised over a broad range of brain structures, it's by no means a given, as Zenestrad would have fine claim, that plasticity will always be able to mitigate their effects. Bluntly, this is an issue in need of empirical research and conceptual revision in the light of that research, rather than wishful thinking and snake oil. The next slide in Zenestrad's Everything I Find Politically Uncomfortable Conveniently Fails carousel is the role of reverse inference in neuroimaging. The first half of the book is dedicated to examining the neuroscience that has been done related to the subject and how they rely on something called a reverse inference. From a philosophical perspective, the problematic form of reverse inference, to which both Fine and Poldrack 2006 refer, is a hangover from type-type identity theory and from the deductive tendencies of logical positivism. Positions which philosophers like Putnam and Lewis kicked out of philosophy of mind in the late 1960s. So if anything, the reverse inference problem, in as much as it was a problem up until about a decade ago, serves as an example of why scientists need philosophers in order to understand the critical underpinnings of their own disciplines. There are, however, as discussed by the likes of Hutzler 2012, perfectly acceptable reverse inferences. Inferences consistent with the use of neuroimaging data in an abductive inference to the best explanation context. Inferences which can, via applications of Bayesianism and within the context of contemporary intertheoretic revision, rather than outdated attempts at transitivity across putative identicals, avoid affirming the consequent. So any suggestion that all neuroimaging data is fallacious due to reverse inference is an overgeneralization. Not that this stops Zenestrad from mounting a defense of it. One of the more common criticisms of Cordelia Fine's book is that she's dismissing the results of neuroimaging broadly based on the results of a few bad apples. However, the fact that someone before her was able to identify the same problem would seem to back her assertions up. But a crap. That fine cites Poldrack no more backs up generalizations about neuroimaging than two people happening to repeat the same claim that some black people commit street crime backs up the assertion that all black people are street criminals. Zenestrad's inference here is as shoddy as those typically employed by racists. Another thing she does is she criticizes a few studies that were done on sex differences in toy preference in primates. She says that the researchers don't even know what the parameters of male toys versus female toys are that make them preferred. What this inconsistency demonstrates is that what is defined as masculine or feminine is subjective and arbitrary to begin with. I agree. Terms like these are indeed open to different interpretations by different researchers. It could be argued, though, that this is a consequence of the greater role of interpretation in the social sciences, including the explicitly anti-natural neo-Kantian interpretations of the Verstein school, unlike the natural sciences, wherein, unsurprisingly, perhaps such interpretivism is largely absent, in which case Fine's criticism surely weighs in favour of the naturalisation of social explanation rather than against it. She also criticizes non-neuroimaging research that compared the visual interest of male and female newborns in a mobile versus a face. Fine's main criticism of the study is that the, it makes a mistake in presenting the stimuli in order rather than simultaneously because attention is very fluid in the first few days of life and presenting the stimuli in order could skew the results. She also criticizes the study for not taking adequate measures to blind the experimenters to bias. What Fine's criticism of the study in question amounts to is that it falls short of, in her own words, the best standards of methodology. I happen to agree with her and disagree with Baron Cohen in this case. Her criticisms could, though, be mitigated by a relatively straightforward redesign and repeat, with regard to the blinding procedures of future studies, for example. What would be interesting to know at this point in his video is whether or not, if such improvements were to be implemented, Zenestrad would accept similar results as evidence of biological factors. 
The difference between an honest discussioner and an unreachable zealot being a willingness to accept correction in the face of agreed upon standards of evidence. And because having made it this far, I honestly can't tell which of those options I'm dealing with. Sorry, Zenistrad. The overall point that she's bringing up is that sex differences tend to be over-exaggerated via faulty methodology and that doing so allows people to use this as a means of justifying the status quo. Well, faulty methodology may exaggerate the role of sex differences in gender, or it may understate them, but it doubtlessly leaves us in ignorance of them. Which is precisely why, to boldly assert, as Zenistrad would have fine do, that faulty methodology naturally counts against them, is to make a fallacious appeal to ignorance. And speaking as a fellow progressive, as someone who is no less set in his heart against the injustices of the status quo than Zenistrad, I would also like to remind him that nothing sabotages our cause quite so effectively as appeal to fallacious argument. Bullshit never emancipated anyone. Thank you for listening.